So um, I teach at Doan, I teach biology. I've been teaching for, I don't know how long, 25 years, 26 or something like that. Um, but I've been a firefighter, a wildland firefighter for 24 years. This will be my 24th season um, going out and, and burning the prairie. My science, what I actually study is fire ecology. And I set things on fire and look at how plants and animals respond to it. And so when I was asked to do, the, do one of these talks, there's lots of cool things I really want to talk about. But I love fire and it's a blast. I was hoping to talk about fires and explosions and it turns out just to get through this in a short amount of time and allow time for um, questions, I've really only concentrated on fires. There's one explosion in here, but really we're just going to be looking at fires. So I'm going to be um, moving back and forth to show different clips so we can see uh, different aspects of fire. And this first clip is, is one of my favorite shows. Um, this is uh, from The Incredibles when they're uh, moonlighting at night as superheroes. And so we're only going to watch the first part of this. And well, the music's on on my speaker, but you, uh, you don't need to watch it or listen to it. So they got people on their backs, on their shoulders. He's run out, Frozone's run out of water because there's no water in the air because it's too hot. People are still sitting on their backs. They have this long conversation. How long do you think you could survive standing there? It's cool. We'll actually go through and walk through this. You'd have about enough time to take a breath and say, damn, and you wouldn't get damn out. You'd be like, and your mind would think damn, and then you would fall over dead. So because they're superheroes and they get to smash through walls and not hurt the people they smash through the wall with, um, the superheroes get to live. But the... Uh, people on their back would, would die. And, and so when I watch these movies as firefighters, or as a firefighter, I look at them and you, I just tear them apart. And so most people don't want to sit next to me when I'm in a movie because it's, it's all the physics and everything they do is crazy. But the, the only thing that this person is doing, whoever puts the, usually it's a damsel in distress on his shoulder, is just protecting him from the radiation. And if he wants to make it out alive, he's really going to need two people, one on each shoulder, to protect him. And if he holds his breath, he can make it out. They will bake. They will be dead before he gets out of the building and be cooking by the time he comes out and, and sets them on the ground. So the way to survive a Hollywood fire, as near as I can tell, is put victims on your shoulders and uh, then you can run out and you'll be great. So there's a couple things we got to cover here first. Um, just some, some basic numbers. Normal body temperature, there's no such thing really as normal, it's about that body temperature. You start feeling pain at about this temperature, and it's, it's sort of a range. If any of you guys got into a hot tub that's really hot, the temperatures at a hot tub is supposed to stop at 104, um, and you get in, it's like, ah, 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 and you get in after a few seconds, like, oh, okay, I, I can do it. So a little bit more than 104, you start feeling real pain. By the time you get to 111, 100, 113, somewhere in there, most people will declare what they put their hand on is hot enough to burn them. Um, human skin starts to rec receive a first degree burn at 118. And these numbers are a little odd because it assumes that you're in air. So you're standing somewhere where the air is moving by you, your skin is still evaporating, you're still cooling yourself off. If this was water, if you put your hand in water at about this temperature, you would receive a third degree burn. That is, you would boil your skin enough to, to really bake it and damage it after about three hours. And that takes a lot of <laughs> determination to hold your hand in water that long and let it cook. But I want you to see that that temperature is you're, start, you're now starting to get into a kill zone depending on the environment that you're in. If you're in air, um, you get a first degree burn. Get up to 130 degrees, you start picking up second degree burns. Um, I love this statement, tissue becomes numb. This is what we call a third degree burn and the benefit of a, a third degree burn is you don't feel any pain. I don't recommend getting a third degree burn so you can say, ha ha, I don't feel pain. But this is, this is what they're talking about. At 140 degrees, you start, excuse me, feeling pain. Human skin is destroyed instantly at 162 degrees. And if this is steam or um, water, it, you are burned much higher. You reach this, uh, this permanent damage zone much earlier. Water boils and produces steam. This is a real problem for firefighters. If my gear is at somewhere around, say, 300 degrees, which is really, really hot, and someone sprays me with a hose, that water is going to turn to steam very, very quickly and is going to burn me really bad and really fast. So structural firefighters, the ones that wear those bunker gear, that big heavy gear, they have a vapor barrier inside their uniform because they're going to get sprayed with water all the time that doesn't allow moisture in. They are in, and this is a really creepy thing to think about or, or, or unnerving thing, they're in a plastic bag. 
and they're sweating their brains out inside that plastic bag working, going to this fire, and it's really, really hot. But without that vapor barrier, they'll actually be burned by their own hoses. If you swing a hose around, if I was, you guys, if all of us were in this room and it was on fire, I'm like, hey guys, we gotta go this way. And I hose you all, I would have burned you all just with the steam coming off of that. So they need to know this. So this is the, the glass transition for polycarbonates. And this is really just saying we take a chunk of plastic like these chairs, and at this temperature, I can now put my hand on the chair and it will ooze down. It won't melt on its own yet, but we're getting close to that. Melting temperature of polycarbonates. Why would a firefighter want to know this know these two things. Why is that a helpful thing to know? If you're standing in a house and the thing next to you starts melting, what does that mean the temperature is outside your mask? It is now hot enough outside your mask to kill you almost instantly when you take a breath. That is, you're now in a very, very dangerous zone and you need to either decide to get out or put the fire out. One of these two decisions have to, have to be made very, very quickly. And we'll take a look at this. If you guys are watching the slides rolling, um, we can actually talk about uh, some, some cool aspects of the slides. Cotton starts charring. Um, so my firefighting equipment, the equipment I wear is Nomex. It's a lightweight um, piece of gear. The reason we wear it is once it's caught on fire, which is a bad thing, it puts itself back out. As long as I can step out of the fire, it'll go out. If I'm wearing cotton and cotton catches on fire, it's like, hey, I'm on fire, and it'll keep on burning. So that's a bad thing. Um, but it helps firefighters know also what's going on around them. So these are other things that, that we like to keep track of. Um, protective gear, this is including my gear, will start burning at about 550, 570 degrees. And so if you notice that you have, like after a fire, like, oh, it was kind of hot, you look down and the, the little lip of your pocket that's hanging out is singed all the way around it, that tells you how close you were to that heat. I don't wear a respirator, so if I'm standing next to something that's getting that hot, there's a chance had my mask or anything shifted, I could have taken a breath of really superheated air and burned the inside of my lungs. So when, we are, when we're charring our clothes, um, it's an indication that the firefighter's making a mistake uh, for the type of burning they're doing. This is the temperature inside of the room after a flashover, and I really want you guys to pay attention. You just say it's 1,000 degrees. So um, as a room heats up, depending on the type of the room, if it hasn't been ventilated, the gas starts building up inside that room, and eventually that gas will catch on fire. We see it as smoke. You and I would look like, oh, that's smoke. It's really unburnt fuel. Once it gets hot enough, it'll flash over, and the whole top of the ceiling will be rolling fire, and just instantly after that, the temperature inside the room will be well over 1,000 degrees, which means any firefighter hanging out in there in their bunker gear has about 20 seconds to decide whether or not they need to get out. Uh, most of them decide it's time to leave. So how does heat move? How does heat move through a system? How does heat move through this room? Bueller, Bueller. How does heat move? Yeah. Diffusion. Okay, so does heat move through, move by diffusion? So what's diffusion? Moving from a high concentration to a low concentration, diffusing out. Heat itself doesn't move by diffusion but it can heat up molecules that do move by diffusion. And if you get a lot of energy to those molecules, they move really fast. What do we call that when molecules do that when they're hot? We don't call it diffusion. We give it its own little name. Convection. Convection. So if I have a, a, a chunk of gas moving and it bounces into me and bounces off, it transfers heat. So I'm exchanging heat right now with little molecules, and that's convection. So a convection oven takes hot air, and puts a fan on it and keeps that hot, hot air moving around. So convection is awesome. I mean, it's really, really good. What's another one? Other forms? Bueller? Yeah. Radiation. Radiation, right? So you guys are radiating right now. You guys at this very moment are sending heat towards me. It's awesome. You're keeping me warm. You're radiating heat. How fast does radiation move? Speed of light. Speed of light, right? So. If you guys look out, well, some of you guys can look out, you can see the, the N up on top of, I'm assuming it must be the stadium or something over there, it's got a letter N. That right now is radiating heat to me. It's probably not making it through the glass. Some of it is. The light's making it here, and it's moving at the speed of light. So the instant it go, it's here. So if I start a fire over there, can I feel heat from it? Yeah, probably not much, because it drops off at this negative inverse law, and I'll show you a picture of it drops off really fast. And there's one other form of heat transfer. Conduction, and what's that? Like when you touch it, yep. 
Yep, so if you turn the burner on on your stove and lean over, <laughs> that's nice. That is conduction, right? So you're sending heat out. Conduction is really interesting. So we have convection, radiation, conduction. Conduction in fires is not really important. It's really, really good at starting fires, um, particularly electrical fires. So we can have a short in the building somewhere heating up and eventually get hot enough to set the surrounding fuel on fire and we'll start burning fuel by the wall. We'll start setting things on fire. Once a fire is going and a fire starts roaring up through this room, it's gonna be burning the ceiling. And yeah, we can say conduction helped it get through to burn the next floor, but we got direct flame on it. So conduction in terms of once the fire is going doesn't play a really big role in it compared to the other two. So this first one, actually I don't even have to run this video, but we'll run this video because I downloaded it and put it on here. Um, here's a candle. Where is the convection on this candle? Where's convection associated with the Annoy the, I don't know why the person's blowing on it. Ignore the person blowing on it. He videotaped and breathed on it. Where is it hottest near this candle? Yeah, right above it. So if, if I put my hand up here, how long can I leave my hand up there? Not long at all. How long could I leave my hand on the side? A long time. This is radiation. I can put my hand up there. Ah, oh, it's nice and warm. If I put my hand over the top, I'm going to burn it. And that is convection. That is heated gas molecules coming up and touching my skin and transferring heat to me. So how serious, so we talk about convection, particularly for what I do, I'm a wildland firefighter, is then a problem because I set the ground on fire and the smoke goes up and unless someone's jumping through the smoke up there, I'm never, I never have to deal with that heat. So for me, it's not a problem. How about for a house fire? Yeah, so this is really cool. If, as long as you're not above it, convection's negligible. This next one, and this, this is shot on vomit cam. My, I have a, a fire helmet that I wear, and um, people complain when we put up these videos because it, I'm looking, I'm fighting a fire, I'm doing stuff, um, and they call it vomit cam, and this one's even worse than that one. So could I take the convection that was normally going straight up and turn it a different direction? Could I go sideways with it? And this one is pretty cool. I'm going to stop this a couple of times as we go through this. So here's our fire. Well, that's a bad spot. Okay, so here's our fire. It was set down here, somewhere down here. Someone's having a barbecue, whatever, had the family over, threw out a firework, cigarette, whatever. But the fire raced up the hill. And convection, the wind is what, which way is the wind going looking at this? Yeah, the wind's going up and over the hill. So we have the fire coming up. It's going over the hill. We now have a convection zone of just pumping hot gas right, and fortunately for these two buildings, right between them. Unfortunately for these two buildings, we have about, well, that building there has about another 40 seconds, um, and then life will be bad for it. So, this is, oh, no. I'm killing them. Got to go back. Every time that little thing disappears on me, we'll be in trouble. There we go. Okay, well, let's go up a little bit more. So just a few seconds later, so we're now 50 seconds into him filming this. This first house is now completely involved in, the, involved in terms of it's completely on fire on this front side because as the fire came up that hill, convection hit it right here on the side of the house. It hit the grass burned up. As it burns up, it burns into this U-shape, burns up, hits the hill. It's gone out almost here at the base of the hill. We have a big blast furnace coming up this way. And fortunately, at the moment, this big blast furnace is coming up between the two houses. But it's still convection. It's just we're just pumping hot gas right onto the side of this house. And it does something, well, cool and unfortunate. So I'm going to just keep skipping it forward a little bit. So this second house over here on the left is doing pretty good. So... This is the house that took the brunt of it as this fire came up, rolled up this hill. And this is just little small shrubby stuff. I mean, there's bare ground in here. So as this fire came up here, this house took the brunt of it. It's going between these two houses. How do you guys think this will turn out for these houses? So we will jump ahead a few seconds. So now we're at a minute 30 seconds. Now you zoomed out. So we don't have much fire on the hillside. This, side, this little side here is still going. We have huge, this is between those two houses, still a huge amount of fire. Just it's a chimney just blasting air up through there. This house is now toast. The side of this house, the side of the house right here is really getting burnt bad. 
So here's that fire. Here's our second fire. And fortunately for this homeowner, let's let this back out a second. Oh, come on. So that was the first one. Here's the second one. And this homeowner, I'm going to let this go just a little bit longer, has left some trees right here. So what would have been a really small fire and possibly stopped between this has put the flames right against it. And his house has already started on fire in just a few seconds. This house is, because it hasn't had that direct torch hit, it hasn't been superheated by convection, and it's just taking longer. So we'll skip this up. What's amazing is there's a fire truck there already. I mean, at least you can hear it. So here's what it is just a few seconds later. We're now seven minutes into it. We have a firefighter standing right here. He's losing his, he's trying to keep this house on fire, he's trying to or keep this house from burning. Um, he's losing his spacing. He came in between those two houses and he loses his hose eventually. So this is um, just, an, just to show you what convection can do. If you can pump heat, change the direction, if this had been flat ground or the wind had been blowing this way, these houses wouldn't have burned. But because the houses were uphill, the fire is going to tilt uphill on its own. It's a natural thing that fire does. And then we have wind blowing into it. The convection allows all of this to superheat. As soon as the flames touch it, they burst into flames. And so it's convection is great um, if you can change its direction and point it at something. So, and could I catch convection? Can I catch, like if I had a candle, could I catch that convection and hold it? Well, not with my hands. Let's say I do it with like a steel bowl. I put a steel bowl over a candle. The, top, the, the temperature above that candle, if I put my hand there, is going to burn it really, really quick, right? I mean, and there, I think there was a movie of some guy doing this, proving how tough he was, and held his hand over the fire, and it burned a black spot onto his hand. So I could do that with a bowl. So let's say I have a big salad bowl, candles right here. Could I stick my hand up inside that salad bowl and be safe as long as I wasn't above the candle? You guys see what I'm saying? Would my hand be safe in there? And one no. And this is really cool. So in the, those first series of, of slides, I was on those slides that were going by at the beginning, one of the questions is, where's the kill zone in this room? And it turns out it's that trap convection gas. So I don't have the convection's going up. If I give it some wind, I can blow it sideways. If I seal it in a room, I can start feeling, filling up the room and move all that con connection energy and just move it lower and lower and lower and lower. And so you see a little bit of smoke and like, oh, this is fine. And you fall over and you're dead, which is bad, so don't do that. So we're going to watch this firefighter. This is a training video. Let me shut off the sound here because they're just talking about it. So why is, why is he starting the fire down at the bottom? What is he utilizing? Because convection, right? If he, if he started this fire up here, it's the exact same fire burning the same fuel, but the fuel is not being superheated by convection. So that little candle, if I put my hand above it, burns very, very quickly, burns my hand very quickly, I put it to the side, and it doesn't. So as it turns out, it's going to race up through here just due to convection and direct flame contact. You want to avoid direct flame contact. Okay, so watch the position of where the firefighter ends up. Where's the camera? Where's the level of the camera? So he's just above the counter. Here's a counter right here. So he's not standing. I want to point out a couple of things as this goes. So we have blinds up here, and you'll see that's a solid line up here. There's, there's, that's just a single sheet of fabric. Um, in a second, it'll change. We have Venetian blinds hanging, and it's now been about a minute. So we're now trapping the gas. That hot gas is being trapped right up here. This is a trailer home. The cool thing about trailer homes is they're built very flame resistant. The wall hasn't caught on fire yet. The paint hasn't even started peeling yet. Ceiling's not even burning yet. It's got direct flames. Now watch the, the blinds. So that is now, this zone is probably somewhere around 200 to 300 degrees right across here. And it's a bubble right here and it's spreading out. And you'll watch these blinds go as it, that heat starts moving across. Never touched by the flame. It was just convection. So now I've trapped that convection inside this room. So 
because we'll see this next set right across here. This will go, the blinds will start falling down. So what's burning on those blinds or what's actually melting is probably the nylon cords inside there, but you can see this is now just zippering down. So we're now, let's pause this for a second. We're now two minutes into it and the paint just in the last 10 seconds has gone from just fine to now it's burning. That is the, the it's flame retardant. It's trying to stop the fire, but you put that much heat on, it's gonna keep on going. So I'm gonna jump ahead, well, we'll let this go. So now we have fire spreading out across the top of this. If this isn't burning, why are there flames up here? Huh? Yeah, so this is fuel coming off this wood that hasn't burned yet. It's still trying to burn, trying to get oxygen in, and it's burning out here. So now it's reaching all over across. If you look right here, the couch is now starting to catch on fire. It's gassing, it's outgassing. So that is now hot enough to start leaking its own flammable gas. Where's the camera's height now? Look at the counter. We have a flat counter, and it's almost a straight line. So the firefighter's kneeling down, running this camera below the level of this hot gas because it's going to be passing over the top of them. And you can't see it, and you, can't, you don't know it's there until the sides of your head start burning, your ears start burning. Um, they surely have masks on, but all of this suddenly becomes an issue, and so you just stay down. And you only have to do that once and realize, huh, I guess they do really do want me to stay down. So it's starting to spread. I'm gonna back us out here a little bit. So now the firefighter's backing down. It has now been three minutes and we have a smoke layer developing right here. This, uh, um, whatever is the shelving is trapping the heat inside there for a moment and you'll see it start coming around. So it's now starting to fill up in the hallway. You'll see some blinds right here. will start falling down. So we're now, there's no fire in the hallway. There's nothing going on. If you looked at it, you opened your door and you heard the smoke alarm and turned, watch this blind. That's at 200 some, 300 some degrees, forcing that blind to come down. So if you'd opened your door and got a face full of smoke and thought, I'll run down the hall and save my kids, you would be dead right about here. And so now look at, look at our smoke level. That is the convection zone. So we've now had a bubble that's trapped that little fire and it's getting down lower and lower. And this is all unburnt fuel. What does it need to burn? We need oxygen. So as soon as someone cracks a window, opens a door, air's gonna go rushing in and smoke's gonna come billowing out and it's just gonna burst into flames. And so they vent it. The smoke was coming out really heavy right there and then it stopped and I think they cracked this window down here. So it gives you an idea of things you can do with convection. Um, here's this fire, this window um, screen is right behind the camera and this is looking in front of the camera. So they have a little fire going and you can see the temperature on the side and we'll let this one run. So the temperature on the side, um, just starting to get hot up here from the gas. You can see the convection building up. This is radiation, it's going sideways. Here's a window and you'll see this change the whole room as soon as the, the window's broken. Temperature keeps going up. I'm gonna keep jumping us through this because we want to see the end stuff. So a little bit hotter, there's no fire up here, but we're now over 300 degrees and you can see the smoke line starting to develop, starting to push down. This camera will recalibrate this side. So we're now at 500 degrees is red. So now if you stood up, this is the height of the couch. If you stood up, you'd be breathing in air hotter than your oven can get it. And you'd get one breath and, and then life would be bad. And this is just smoke. There's no fire in, in this side of the room. So the camera's recalibrated, so 500 is down here and it's in the white zone, and 1,200 is up here in the dark red. So we have 1,200 coming off the couch. I think the couch is actually on fire at this point. On the top of the couch, you can see the carpet's now rolling up from radiations, baking that carpet. And it's cooling off because this window is broken. And you can see this room is starting to cool off. It's starting to cool off, and the firefighter's busting out this window. So why? Do firefighters vent houses? Why do the firefighters come up with a chainsaw and cut a hole in the house? Or immediately, the first thing they do is go up and bust out a window. It immediately lowers the temperature. What else does it do? Let's all the gas escape. That gas hasn't exploded yet. And so the way you get a flashover or a backdraft is you go and you open up a door, bust out a window, that gas comes billowing out, 
if it's coming out, something has to go in. And it's that cold air that's coming in. If you have really hot gas that wants to rise like a hot air balloon, really cold gas that's going to come in, that cold air is bringing in oxygen. And so you'll see on a house that's about to do this, air starts sucking in low. At the same time, hot air, gas is boiling really violently out of the top. Once that oxygen gets into it, it blows the whole thing up. So if I vent a house, will it speed up this, the rate at which it burns? Yeah, it's going to speed it up a lot faster, but I'm not going to die inside thinking, hey, I wonder if it's in here. So it's a, a really helpful tool. Radiation, radiation drops off at this inverse square. So it's actually, you know, right here, my hand would burn, right here it wouldn't. So radiation doesn't really affect a lot of fires unless you have a video running, unless you have um, a lot of it. So one candle, not a lot of radiation. 10 candles, a whole lot of radiation. Okay. So they're starting this fire. This is a, just a demonstration. The whole outside here is open. There's a fake roof, so it slants up, so there's an air, air pocket up there to hold this gas. So we're going to jump through this, and I want you to see... So here's our, our gas zone, our hot gas zone, strapped up. This is all convection, and this gas, some of it is burned, and some of it hasn't. So there could be flammable gas down here, but it's coming out and cooling off and not getting in contact with the flame. So... Here, we now see the couch is starting to outgas. That's all flammable gas soaking into this. And you'll see the carpet in a second start outgassing. So we are at 48, 248 seconds. We now have heavy fuel, heavy flames. Now this gas is hot enough that it's still going to burn even at this low oxygen level. So now the whole roof across the top is starting to get involved. And if you look at the carpet on the bottom, the carpet's now burning from radiation burst into flames just from the radiation coming across the top of it. So if that was a fire resistant uh, carpet, maybe it wouldn't burn um, until you get into four or 500 degrees, which means if you're crawling across the floor of that room, you will not live long. Okay, so this is the only explosion in here, but it's a, it's a cool one. Um, it's not that one. This is a TV show. So here we have, I, this is like Oklahoma or Texas. This is a big oil tank out here. And so people have shown up from all around because it's big black smoke and they want to watch this fire. And one of the things that's gonna happen here in Hollywood, we want big explosions and lots of fire, but we don't want meat in that fire. We don't want enough fuel in that fire to maintain a burn for any length. It's got to go whoosh and go out immediately. And I can do it several times, but I don't want a lot of fuel. So here's a lot of fuel still burning up inside there. This tank is superheating, and now it's starting to vent. Now watch these people. Everyone starts running, and how much radiation is coming from the top of this fire? And that's a direct line radiation. How far would this person have to run to get out of the direct line of sight of that fire? I mean, that's, it's just amazing. And so these guys are about 200 yards from the fire, um, and they receive second and third degree burns uh, during this. You don't ever really want to go up to an oil tank that's on fire and rubberneck it. So none of these people look like they're really up to sprinting out, out sprinting a fire. Um, if you guys do any uh, research on... Um, the Hindenburg, when it blows up, there's lots of people that jump out and live and perfectly fine, make it start running, and as it's burning and giving off all that heat, it starts burning them, and they're trying to get out of their clothes, and it just makes it worse. So he gets down. The heat's still coming off. He's hiding in the shadow of this burn. Um, and we'll show you in a second. There's some second-degree burns, and they don't, I'm assuming, don't show everybody. They're only showing the guys that are out here by this cameraman. Um, So he's got burns up here, he's got blisters on his back, blisters on his back. So just in that short period of time, it was more than enough radiation um, to burn this individual. So let's put this all together. So we're going to look at a, a couple of clips just showing kind of the craziness of it all. So this is a shot from the vomit cam on my helmet. Um, so this is a prairie. I'm walking away shooting this video, purposely shooting this video. So I have a little fire that I can step over really easy. Could I step over this fire? Yeah, so this I could probably hop over. This, the flames are going to burn me. I've got maybe 10 feet of fire I have to walk through, and it's about this high. So 10 feet of 800 to 1,000 degree fire means I burn. Where is the convection? If I'm running, let's say for whatever reason my buddy set this fire and I was down there, and I've got to now run through this fire before it becomes a big roaring head fire, what point will I start getting burned? Where's the convection? 
yeah, the convection's going this way. And unfortunately, this is sort of a hill and my camera's, my head's tilted sideways, so it makes it look like the Earth's rolling away. But it's, it's right here. So as I approach this fire, if that uh, stand marks the edge of the flames, as I'm running towards it, breathing hard, at about this point, I start sucking in superheated air, 500, 600 degree air. I get about one more breath, it burns the inside of my lungs, my face now feels all of that, and we call this the crumple zone. You're like, oh, I'll make it through, I'm super amped. And now you're laying down, face down on the fire in a lot of pain, and this whole fire then still has a minute and a half, two minutes to burn over you. So this is a great way to end up dead, and it's a little tiny grass fire. Um, every year in Nebraska, we end up burning a handful of firefighters, um, prescribed firefighters, uh, because they look at it even uh, uh, structural firefighters and look at it and say, oh, it's just a grass fire. So that's the hill I came down. I came down over here and I turned up and came this way. And I want you to see how fast this little fire line goes from a little tiny fire line to a kill zone just in seconds. And I'll back away from this a little bit more. So I have a little tiny fire. I can hop over that, jump back and forth several times. Now I'm getting a little hotter. Getting a little, now I'm going to be burned. And there's now no way to approach this zone without being burned by the fire. So this is just a grass fire. If you drove your truck through this, I'd like to think your truck would make it. As it turns out, the odds of getting across this fire line are 50-50. Um, in terms of the trucks that have done it and were damaged and still made it through, we know it's about, the average is about 50%. Could I stand here? The head of the fire has gone by, but this is still really, really hot. You can't walk across this. There's superheated gases coming up off of this. This would still burn you, even though you don't see anything. It looks like it's just black uh, smoke. So a fire line, once a fire goes by, if the head fire was at that wall, this would still be a death zone to be standing in. It makes it really, really hard to, uh, to work around grass fires. So here's, that was a really small grass fire. This one's a big one. Um, we're burning a little small plot about twice the size of this room. And so this is just the, uh, the last strip that we're going to burn. And the person with the torch is right here. So they're walking along, setting this on fire. So we're at two seconds. They just set that on fire. So that was two seconds ago. Well, however many seconds ago. And now we are at 11 seconds. And now we're at 13 seconds. So you have about 13 seconds until this would burn a truck, a house, anything else that got in the way. And fortunately, the whole area below it had already been burned. Um, okay, this one's inside a fire, um, inside a forest fire. So, oh, I gotta keep my little mouse moving. As soon as that little button moves away, you can't see it. Okay, so what's the day like? What does that look like? Is it a sunny day? Yeah, it looks like a sunny day, right? Nice day. We have the fires coming from behind us. Here's the temperature in degrees Celsius. And watch at what point it starts getting dark. That's the cloud front moving across. We now have embers falling, and now the trees are starting to vaporize. That is, they have enough radiation that the trees are now starting to, to leak uh, gas, and the gas is coming to me. So the fire, if this is you, the fire's coming up behind you. The trees from radiation have started leaking gas. They're actually now vaporizing and are being sucked back towards you. There's no convection burning these trees yet. And that was, we are now uh, 14 seconds into this. How long do you think you could go before you would die? Temperature's already about 150 degrees Celsius. So above the boiling point of water, you could hold a cup of water in your hand and boil it now. Everything in front of us is catching on fire to radiation. Now here's the convection and the main fire front is now moving through. Temperature skyrocketing. So now we're up to 800 degrees Celsius. So now oxygen actually is the thing that's limiting this fire. Um, if we could get more oxygen in, this thing's, I don't know, probably this is a test plot, but I think it's a quarter mile wide. So oxygen's a limiting factor down here in the bottom of this fire. It's moving through really, really fast. Some of these trees will catch on fire. This one looks like it's got a good start. It's burning all the way up the side. Um, others won't. So when a fire like this goes through, it kills out a lot of understory. Sometimes it'll burn these trees, sometimes it won't. It just depends on the speed of the fire, uh, the drought, how much water is um, still in the trees. So we're going to jump up just a little bit. So we're now back down to 500 degrees. Oh, look, there's sunlight. What a nice place to be. Ah, oh, oh, nuts. Keep forgetting I have to move that forward. Okay, hold on. We'll jump this up. 
Okay. So we'll stop kind of right in here. So do you think you could stand like right here where it's not burning? And we'll let this go. And at one point, look how much the fire's died down. A little campfire over here and a little campfire over there. And that's well, a sloppy campfire and there's a log on fire. Could you stand here? So you're still in the convection zone. Everything around you for, in this case, a quarter mile's on fire. And the air that's blowing through is above 500 degrees Celsius. So even at this point, um, you're toast. And those shake and bake bags that firefighters use um, you, could, you wouldn't have survived this. They can't take direct heat, and they can't take a, a direct uh, convection. They can take some, but they can't take a, a blast furnace convection. So this crew um, is in, uh, this, they're out in California. Oh, no, this is, a, this is a great one. So here they are. They're signed to protect that bridge. They've run their hoses underneath, and instantly they're now in a chimney. They're in this convection. The temperature inside that's probably... 1,000, 1,500. They've moved back. They can't move up here because their hoses are laid down around here. The fire comes over the top and now sets the, the trees they're in, the shrubs are in on fire. And this is chaparral, so it's going to burn really fast. That isn't messing around. They back up a little bit more and they're out of space. And this is the butt saving crew came in and saved their butts. So it's a, uh, this is a uh, commercial essentially for helicopters. Why you'd have to have the commercial, I'm not sure, but I'd want a helicopter, thank you. Um, so this is, um, this is in Orange County, this is in California. This is a, a firefighting crew that's been rolled out to stop a fire coming up. The fire's coming along the side, they're coming up on this hill, and they're gonna try to dig a line and hose out a line in front of this fire. So here's the crew, this side's on fire, and that's the side they wanna put out. And so this is an odd shot. Um, if we had the, the sound on, you could hear this discussion. The crew's right up here, this is the fire. They put a fire line up that side, and they're trying to put it out. Here's the crew. Now, an ember has jumped off of this fire and landed down at the base of the hill below them. So the fire trucks now are down here trying to stop it, but that crew is now between the fire they were putting out and an ember that's landed below them, and that's going to go straight uphill, straight into where they're at. And all they have is this little patch of black. So the crew is standing right up in here. There's the crew. Um, so they're calling for an air support at this time. It's really weird to listen to this. So they're calling in an air support. There's no air support. Here's the flames. They're in that convection. They're pulling out their aluminum foil bags and they're gonna lay down. Here's the fire that they were trying to stop on this ridge to keep it from hitting and just rolling right past that road. Um, so these guys deploy. One of the nice things about this particular one is we've had people close enough on the other side of the fire to take pictures. Normally, when you're with a group of people deploying, you're too busy try not to die, to turn around and take pictures. So this flame is blasting straight into them, um, and these guys all end up surviving. And they're surviving, they're in the convection zone, but they're on that ridge. And so the heat's shooting up this way, the heat from the other fire's shooting up this way, and they're in a black patch. So the fire's not gonna creep into them and actually impinge on them, it's gonna come right up and stop. Had that been, here's the, the slope, this is a better shot of that slope. Had they been on the slope and had to deploy, they'd have been in the convection zone and no one would have survived this fire. Um, and this is the rescue crew now cutting a line to get up to them and uh, pull them out. All right, so let's take a look at this movie again. So here we are coming in. So what's the temperature inside this room? 600 to 1,000 degrees. This is instant death. There's no like, ha I'll just take a breath and swear about the fire or complain about this. You're going to die. So not only are these guys superheroes and super strong and whatever, they're also flame resistant and there's no oxygen in this room or very little. And so somehow they can breathe on carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and really superheated air. Now watch when the roof caves in. This is just bizarre. The roof caves in and he picks up another body. Crash. Roof caves in. All right, stay behind me. Another body. And he takes off and smashes all those bodies through the wall. So again, hard to survive. Here is a, um, a backdraft. This is a crazy thing. So firefighters, when they go in the building, throw the mask on because this is all superheated. You're standing in smoke. It's all superheated. It's all hard to breathe. But because he's cool, he always has his coat open, which means the only protection he has is his T-shirt. But when you have a chest like his, he's tough enough. His chest can take it. Oh, and then we got to watch this home on the scene. Uh, let's skip this up. So, checks the fire. He told his partner to put the mask on. 
This could be on fire. They don't know. They're walking around with a flashlight looking for fire. Comes up to this room, and we get to see the backdraft there. It's sucking in. So if that fire smoke is sucking in, what has to be coming out? So, so what's happening in a backdraft is air is being sucked into this. But unless that room is expanding like a balloon somewhere, gas has to be going out somewhere else. So this doesn't happen. Once they open the door, cold air comes from the bottom because it's heavy. Hot air comes racing out the top because it's light. And that's what gets the air in. Until you open that, nothing's going to happen. It'll sit and seep and keep trying to suck in oxygen. But it'll be doing it the whole time and gas will be leaking out of the top. So in here, he's supposed to have checked the handle to make sure the handle's hot. And so this is a little bit exciting in terms of how big the explosion is. But you can get a, a big enough explosion to knock people over. So he gets hit by this fire. And then the fire goes out. Everything else is normal stuff. The most flame resistant stuff here is his clothes. <laughs> Nothing else in the room is on fire but the flame resistant gear. And so Hero jumps on top, opens his coat, chest can take the heat, and now he's on fire. And now they sprayed him with water, and if, that, if he was hot enough that his coat actually caught on fire, Bull has his chest open, he would have just burned the snot out of him. He would have been the one that died. Okay, here's another one. So, just these, you know, this is why you don't go to movies with me. Um, they're up on a rack. What should be happening to them? They're up on this ledge. What should be happening? Fire all around them, fire underneath them. Convection should be coming up and baking them. They're just hot dogs sitting on a rack now. So look at all that fire coming up through there. They're sitting right next to it. And of course, they're, they're fighting a fire in a gas station. I don't know what the <coughs> drums are. Um, so the hose, by the way, this is seriously dangerous. I mean, this is how you knock your teeth out, trying to knock one of those things. So we have all that fire, all that radiation coming up through there. We have all this radiation coming from the sides. There shouldn't be any oxygen inside here, let alone uh, the temperature should be in the thousands. And nothing, can, this is, talk about conduction. This is on fire. The temperature of this pipe should be burning the snot out of them. And it's not. So I like this, this scene where he comes and he rescues the... Here we have mean fire coming across the top of the ceiling. The radiation in there then should be enormous coming at him, but he's tough. His skin doesn't need firefighting gear. His coat's open, because tough firefighters have their coats open. If you guys want to try this in your chemistry class, I don't recommend it. As soon as you snap a, the top off a pressurized tank, oh, that'll be awesome. But he throws it in there, it's CO2, it apparently is supposed to put out the fire, so he's got seconds. And he's going to run across. Jump this. This will go to my favorite senior. They do actually have his, his coat steaming, which is kind of fun. You know it's a bad day when your coat is steaming. So he's fighting fire to get his buddies up to help his brother. And then the fire sneaks up on him. Ah, evil fire sneaking up on him. In this next scene, he's got to sneak up on the fire. So he's walking up to it. Ta-da! Take that! Completely bizarre. All right. So any questions? <laughs> That's how to fight fire. And so I, my conclusion would be the only way to, to sur survive a fire in this situation is to be in Hollywood because there's no meat behind those fires. When that fireball comes up, it burns out really quickly. It doesn't keep rising and burning. It's not completely full of fuel. This forest isn't just this flame that's giving heat. It's everything else inside there that's still burning that's giving off heat. So in Hollywood, you have to have little small fires um, with no meat behind them, nothing else other than the gas jet they just turned on. Yeah? So it's not the quickest way. <laughs> the quickest way is to run inside a collapsing building and that'll kill you or jump into that fire or whatever. What kills? What's the number one thing that kills structural firefighters? Anybody got a guess? So what's the biggest danger we face? Huh? Taking the convection like they don't. Okay, taking a convection into your face, which if you breathe in hurts, but if I have my mask on and everything else, that'll roll off of me. But if I stand in that convection, what's happening to my body temperature? It's going up. And if I'm a tough guy, and I'm a tough guy, I can take it. I'll stand there, I can take it. I'll keep walking. I can take it. It's kind of hot. I can take it. 
yeah, I can take it. Burnt my leg. Just flesh wound. I can take it. But my heart can't. Your body doesn't, doesn't have any way. Your brain has no way of saying, ha-ha, I'll keep taking it. And your body goes through the process of dying and has a heart attack because you have baked it. And so firefighter, number one killer for structural firefighters is heat stress leading to a heart attack. And often the heart attack doesn't occur until later after they've left the fire. And these are, I'm not the most in shape firefighter in Nebraska, as other firefighters will tell you. Um, so, you know, I'm, because of my weight, I'm probably at a risk of a heart attack. But the people who are dying of heart attacks are young, healthy men and women. They have been tougher than they should have been and continue to work and continue to work and died of exhaustion from a heart attack. And it turns out it's pretty easy to do. Number one killer for both. Next killer is driving to or from a fire. If you drive to a fire, even if you're a wildland firefighter, you're like, oh, yeah, we're going to a fire. You're driving a truck you're not used to driving. It's a big, heavy rig. You've got water in there. It's really big and heavy. And you end up flipping it and dying on the way there. Dying just for both, structural and, and wildland. Driving home, you're exhausted and tired, especially if you're a wildland firefighter. So it's structural firefighters generally fight for an hour or two, come back home. They don't have a long trip. We go out. We'll stay out for days or weeks and drive home, and we might have a two-day trip home. And so the whole crew's tired, the whole crew shouldn't be on the road at all, but we want to get back home and we end up wrecking our trucks on the way back. Two number one killers, isn't that crazy? Because this is obvious. When you see fire, you're like, I will not stand there. But I'll stand next to it and keep fighting. Other questions? So where was the kill zone in that picture? Remember at the beginning, then the slides in the beginning? Where were the kill zones? You guys don't remember? Let's end this, in show, and let's go to this one, right here. So where's the kill zone there? I'm going to turn this on, but it'll flip to the next slide. So we have a firefighter standing right here. You can't see above this. If you were standing there, it would kill you. This is the smoke line. From here down, you would have lived. From here up, you would have died. Here's the smoke line starting to develop. So it's a kill zone in your house. And if you open your door and walk around, there's, oh, baby, right there. But all those plastic letters melted off, and they weren't exposed to the fire. This whole scene, everything inside there is above that smoke level. So in this case, it filled up and got really low. Computers melted. The fan melted. This tree that's really dry didn't, but here's the kill zone. It hadn't made it down to the tree yet. So we talk about this being smoke damage, but really it's heat damage. What speed do I burn in? What speed do you want to set a prairie fire on? So it's cool. When I vent a house, when I don't vent a house, when people vent houses, the nice thing is I now know exactly where the fire is going to go. I've now taken control of this house, and I'm going to move it out a whole I've given it. So when I do a prairie fire, in this case, I want enough wind to push the fire in the direction I want it to go. So I want to burn at least five miles an hour. With a five mile an hour wind, it'll burn this way. So I'll start down, downwind and let it backfire creep around this way. And because I'm impatient, once it gets big enough, I have enough black, I'll send my crews up both sides, we'll come around, set head fire, shook, and it'll burn itself out. If everything goes as planned. Bad day. If your helmet's on fire, it's a bad day. So this is a flashover. That shot was right at a flashover. Heart attack, I have no idea what's going on there. Convection, radiation, just baking them. And so these guys are tough. And they stay out there all day and keep doing it. Pretty soon, you bake yourself into a heart attack. Other questions? No other questions? We have the quietest group on the planet. You guys want to come out and burn with me? It's all volunteer. You can come out. We'll go out and burn with a uh, Tri-County Burn Crew. We can burn out with uh, Spring Creek. So if, you, if you're interested in burning, shoot me an email at bradelder at domecollege.edu. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, there's been so many. Um, you know, my first year burning, my second year burning, um, I was on a crew as a volunteer crew, and, and I was a grad student at the time. I was doing the research that we were, were setting the prairie on fire, and so I was working with the crew. And we went out to do a burn. Um, I had to leave early. I left. They had a wildfire. Um, someone threw an ember out or a cigarette out on the highway, and it burned into the prairie, and we're, we're burning thousands of acres. I mean, so these aren't trivial little small fires. So I was called to come back out. And so I came back out later in the evening, hooked up with one of the, the trucks. We had a fire coming up the hill towards us. We had some pretty big uh, burn breaks that we thought would stop the fire. And they dropped me off to position me. So if any ember jumped, 
you have 20, 30 seconds to put on an ember before it becomes big. And so I have a swatter, which is a stick with a, a mud flap essentially on it. And uh, you know, I'm just out there doing my job and I look at this fire, you can hear it coming and it's just a roar. It's the most amazing thing to hear this roar. And it's coming up and it becomes very clear that it's going to be bigger than any of us thought. And I'm now in front of it and there's no escape. There's no plan. And this is a, a, a foul on, on our part when we set it up. You, you shouldn't be in a place where you don't have an escape zone. I can't outrun this fire. It's coming at 20, 30 miles an hour. So my plan is I have a, a burn out zone about from the wall to here, but the flames are gonna be over my head. And this is how big this fire is. So I'm on the top of a ridge. And so I get down on the downhill side of the ridge in the standing heavy fuel, so I'm in grass. And I get below it because it's the only way to stop the radiation from the fire. So the grass is now protecting my face and my body from this fire. And I'm waiting till it gets over the top, and the flames are over the top of my head. I'm waiting till the grass I'm in catches on fire, and I'm going to move into the black. And fortunately, this zone is black, so at least I'll have stuff not burning in front of me. So I open the grass to look. And they talk about when you get burned, they call it the fire licks you. And that's what it feels like. Physically feels like something just licked you, but it feels like they did it with a knife. I mean, it just feels like it just sliced right through me, and it burnt up the side of my face. And so I was sitting there thinking, ah, I don't know if I'm cut out to be a firefighter. This is not a good plan. And fortunately, the fire died. It, it didn't make it over the ridge. It didn't come. But it was the, the heat, the flames were above us. So that's probably my scariest moment. But it was my second year, and, you know, I was young and stupid. Which happened. I mean, it just, just happens. But the rest of the time, it's, you're always thinking about safety. You're always um, thinking of all the what-ifs. So if I'm going to burn here, and a wind shift happens at this point in the day, what am I going to do? Well, 20 minutes later, what am I going to do now? 20 minutes later, what am I going to do now? Someone shows up and they park their truck in the wrong spot. How am I going to handle that? So now you're always, always thinking about it. And it's, it's weird, but burning is a vacation. When I go out and burn, I think of like all the things that I got to do for my students and all the stuff, the bills, whatever's in my head, all this stuff going through my head. When you're out on a fire, you can't think of any of that. So it's like the perfect vacation. So I love going out and burning. Other questions? Another question? Another question? Great. Well, thank our speaker. Thank you, guys. <laughs>